Good morning. For the safe space cafe. Yes. Who is asking? Who is asking? I can't. Madam Speaker, Steve Kent Leamington. My me my member statement was interrupted by with an order to close the door that I can assure you did not come from my office. So I request that I be have the opportunity to re uh, deliver my statement. The there, there was indeed, uh, there was indeed uh, a comment during uh, the honourable member's statement. Uh, does the honourable member have unanimous consent uh, to uh, reissue his statement? Please, uh, please go ahead. The honourable member for uh, Chatham Limit. Yes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Supreme Court of Canada has declined to hear an appeal by the big telecom companies of a CRTC order that could significantly lower wholesale internet rates. This means that the Supreme Court now joins the federal court in rejecting these appeals with all eyes now on the last remaining appeal, which is in front of the CRTC. Madam Speaker, this issue is of course vitally important to almost all Canadians, as wholesale rates effectively determine what everyone pays for internet access, regardless of provider. In my writing of Chatham Kent. As the pandemic hit, the first action of this government was to provide liquidity supports for Canada's big banks of an unbelievable $750 billion, a banker nirvana. This week, those banks announced $42 billion in pandemic profits so far. This is outrageous as small businesses close and Canadians struggle to feed their families. Other countries have cracked down on profiteering. Why is the Prime Minister so opposed to measures like a wealth tax? And why does he encourage pandemic profiteering? Madam Speaker, I have great respect for the honourable member who posed this question, but I must register my disappointment with his attempt to conflate liquidity support from direct financing from the federal government. The fact is, our focus from the beginning of this pandemic has been to extend supports directly to households and businesses to help them weather the... Honourable member for Carleton. Well, if excuses were paychecks, then we wouldn't have over 800,000 people without jobs since the beginning of the pandemic. But excuses is all we're getting, and they're pretty creative ones, too. The government blames COVID, but of course, the other G7 countries also have COVID, and they all have significantly lower unemployment than Canada. The next excuse is that they tell us that the unemployment rate no longer matters, that we shouldn't worry about it. What they really mean is that the people who are unemployed no longer matter. Well, we think they do matter, and they don't want excuses, they want jobs. But we don't expect that from this government. So what excuses do they have today? Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, with respect, the Honourable Member as a critic for jobs ought to know that the Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics in the United States uses a different definition for unemployment than we do in Canada through Statistics Canada. He's comparing apples to oranges. The reality is because of the measures that we've put forward, we have been able to support 4.5 million workers who have remained on the payroll of their employer through the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy and another 9 million nearly who've received the Canada Emergency Response Benefit so they can keep food on the table for their families. We're going to continue to be there to protect jobs and support Canadians through this time of unprecedented difficulty. None, the Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, in fairness, it is true. The U.S. Bureau does use a different method. But happily, Statistics Canada lines those methods up apples to apples. And so when you compare Canada and U.S. unemployment apples to apples, what do you get? Canadian unemployment is still one-third higher than in the United States. Higher than in Japan, Germany, the UK, uh, Italy, France. Every single G7 country has lower unemployment than Canada. They can't just blame COVID. They can't just shift the statistics. They need to get to work to try and create jobs because what Canadians need are paid. Well, parliamentary secretary. Madam Speaker, with great respect, if the Honourable Member wants to compare apples to apples, I'd point him to the fact that 71% of the jobs have returned from the peak pandemic job losses in Canada compared to 56% in the United States. If he wants apples to apples, I'd point him to labour force participation, which is 64.3% in Canada compared to 613 in the United States. But before we get to the job numbers, if he wants apples to apples, our public health response may not have been perfect, but I would invite him to talk to the family members of 500,000 Americans 
who are no longer living that might have been had they adopted an approach that we took in Canada. We know that public health and economic policy is indivisible, Madam Speaker. And I. Who is asking? Who is asking? Depend on it. When the Prime Minister thought, who should I buy them from? He looked around the world and he said, I know the country that's holding our people hostage. You can imagine the PRC Politburo filled with bureaucrats rolling aground on the ground and gut splitting laughter at this Prime Minister's uh, naivete. Madam Speaker, simple question. When he wasted 100 days in the PRC, what the hell was he thinking? Anyone? I mean, it's just a quarter of a billion dollars. I mean, what's that between friends, right? Anyone? Any data? No? Thank you, Ms. Rampel-Garner. Thank you, Chair.